Good uh, morning, everybody. Today is Monday, September 9th of 2024. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for joining today's live stream today. And the encouragement scripture that I want to start this whole entire program out with is in Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. And I'm going to read it out of the classic amplified version. And it says, fear not, there is nothing to fear. For I am with you. Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you and harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my victorious right hand of rightness and justice. Now, that's a scripture you should read over and over and over again. The first part of it, fear not. There is nothing to fear. And so no matter what is going ha- going to happen, no matter what's going on around the world, no matter what we see, no matter what we hear, when God talks about unprecedented things, he's saying, fear not. There's nothing to fear. Get these scriptures down in your heart. And know that God is bigger than anything you see. He's bigger than anything you hear. He's bigger than anyone we are up against. God is bigger. And one of the other things I love about this scripture, I will uphold you. Up. I will hold you up and retain you with my victorious right hand of rightness and justice. God's about justice. And as we've seen last week, remember what God has been saying to us over and over about the indictments, that they were illusions and that they were things that were not going to go as planned? Well, another thing didn't go as planned. They wanted to sentence him. They wanted to throw him in prison before the election. And that's not going to happen. And I want to remind you of a, of a prophecy that God just gave us it was back in August. And regarding this entire situation. And this was from uh, August 18th of 2024. And it's called, This is Life or Death of a Nation. Judge Mershon does not have the power he thinks he has. A setup is about to implode, and he will fall for the attempts he has made against my David. Shocking evidence is coming forth, which will destroy the so-called conviction against my David. Sentencing? Ha! This is just a distraction and an illusion. The law does not back the so-called sentencing. Just wait, you will see that they are nothing against me. They do not have the power to take him out or imprison him. Your enemies are about to seriously regret the moves they have made in this case because it will bring several more against them. That was August 18th, 2024. And so God is laughing. Remember, he sits in the heavens and he laughs because he sees the defeat of the enemy coming. Even though there was a lot of people afraid about it, even though there was a lot of people wondering what was going to happen. That's when we go back and we look at scriptures. It doesn't matter if it was trying before or if they tried after. It doesn't matter. You go back and you read these scriptures. Fear not. There is nothing to fear. God is the one who's in control. God is the one who is is the judge over all the earth. We have a lot of unjust judges. We have a lot of people who think they can control the law who think they can do whatever they want and twisted the law to make it however they want to make it in order for them to, well, uh, imprison their enemies. Well, God is saying to us, fear not, there's nothing to fear. I want to read it, something else for you in Isaiah 41. Remember God keeps reminding us of his right hand and how powerful his right hand is? Isaiah 41 in verse 13. For I, the Lord, your God, hold your right hand. I am the Lord who says to you, fear not, I will help you. That's why no matter what we see, and no matter what the enemies try, 
God is saying, fear not. There's nothing to fear. And then fear not. I will help you. That's what God wants you and I to know. He is going to help us. And there is nothing to fear because nothing is bigger than God. No matter if you have pains or symptoms in your body, if you have a bad and horrible doctor's report, if you have something come out of the courts against you, no matter what it is, fear not. There's nothing to fear. Nothing is bigger than God, and he will help you. That's a promise. God will help you. All right. Now I want to get to this prophetic word this morning. And this is from September 4th, and it's called The Silencers Are About to Be Silenced. The Silencers Are About to Be Silenced. For I, the Lord, this day am telling you, my children, the silencers are about to be silenced in a massive way. They have done everything they can to stop you from telling the truth or showing the truth. They have chained you in their prisons of disinformation and deception. They're trying to hold you there in their captivity. But just wait when you see how I silence your enemies, how I stop them in their tracks and destroy their power. They no longer will be able to use their tech giants and social media companies to determine what can be put out on the airwaves. No, it's not theirs to control, but it's mine, says the Lord. There will be much truth pouring out over the airwaves with no way for them to stop it. I am bringing the biggest social media giants down as if they were nothing. The ones who've been controlling the narrative will be driven out of their seats of control. A great silence is coming for the ones that have silenced you. The world will become very quiet worldwide. That is to cut off their power so it can be given back to you. So as these things take place with outages, just know it's your enemies that will remain silent and not you. Your enemies will not outlast the silence because these are the days of Haman. My children, get out of those prison cells and shout my words as loud as you can. That will destroy those chains that they have tried to keep you in. These are the days of my vengeance, and it's about to be seen. The rattling, the shaking, the unprecedented, the unconventional, the unusual will intensify. You are going to see these things you have never seen. You are going to hear things you have never heard. There will be things that will be hard to comprehend. You may be asking yourselves, is this really happening? It will be like a dream for you, but a nightmare for the ones against you. I am rattling the cages of the enemies and bringing them to where I need them for their final trap and their total destruction. I am shaking this earth to break it free from the chains of the globalists. You are not their slaves. You are not theirs to control. And soon this will be reality worldwide. Just as the days in Egypt, unprecedented weather, Unprecedented things were seen and experienced by the enemies of my people. Judgment after judgment hit them repeatedly until they let my people go once and for all. They saw and experienced things that had never happened like that on earth. And now that is all going to be amplified around the world and in my nation of the United States. My children, you are in unconventional times. 
things that are not the normal, things you are not used to in an election cycle. Your enemies are terrified of their numbers. They are terrified of your resistance. They are terrified of losing control. So they are willing to do anything they can, no matter the cost, to destroy my David in this country the rest of the way. They will get other nations involved to do some of their dirty work. But it doesn't matter who they choose, it will be the wrong choice. No nation, no man, or their army can stop what is coming for your enemies. And that's my vengeance and judgment that will hit them hard like the plagues of Egypt. To rip them out of their power and their chains off of your necks. You don't belong to them. And I will soon make that clear. Saith the Lord of hosts. My children stand and pray like never before. You're about to experience a resistance like never before. But remember, it will not last. And it's not bigger than me. Your enemies will try and attack you in unprecedented ways. They will try things so devastating it will look like. But it will all backfire against them. Every move they make to take over this nation will be every move toward their great destruction. Obama is nothing. Kamala is nothing. The Biden is nothing. The Clintons are nothing. Klaus Schwab is nothing. The elites are nothing. Their establishment is nothing. Don't you see, my children, your enemies are nothing. And I am the Lord that will cut them off and bring their plans to nothing. My army is moving forward to take them all out, saith the Lord of hosts. George Soros's money will be exposed in a major way. How he and his fellow elites were using their fortunes to rule the world and change world events, along with elections worldwide. How their money helped fund the machine in Washington and paid many of your government officials to pass bills and to make more of your freedoms and take more of your freedoms away. My children, Soros, Gates, Klaus Schwab, the secret societies in the UN, that is really who is running your government and the markets worldwide who are controlling the mainstream media and social media to control what is allowed to be said over the news or what people worldwide are allowed to speak about. Total censorship. Because they wanted total control. Their machine is dying. Their power is collapsing. Their house of cards that took so long to build is falling and crumbling to the ground. So hold on for their last ditch efforts to stay in power. But just like the Pharaoh and his last efforts were for nothing. It was his final act, and then it was all over. My children, your enemies, the pharaohs of today, their end is drawing near, and that will be very clear, says the Lord. The UN will make a bold move against the United States in the land of Israel. But the UN doesn't have the power like they thought they had. And they will regret the decisions they have made when they give themselves away and they won't stay. Because the UN will be ripped apart by me, says the Lord. Something hidden regarding the Afghanistan withdrawal is about to make major headlines and be a nightmare for the Biden and Harris, along with the entire establishment. A piece of information no one knew anyone had is about to be released, and it will crush their narrative in one full swoop. Pakistan will be in your news for a shocking reason. 
An earthquake in Istanbul will be in your news for a significant reason. I told you many unprecedented and unusual things will be taking place worldwide, and it will shock the world. Tamar, this name and this river will be in your news for a surprising reason. A presidential seal will be in your news for a significant reason. My children, change is coming, and unprecedented events will start to take place for your freedoms. My vengeance is guaranteed against your enemies, and soon they will not be laughing, and my words will never of them come to pass. So get ready for great and significant change upon this earth to bring you out of the hands of the pharaohs of today. Freedom is yours, and no longer will they be able to manipulate it under their power. So prepare your hearts on what you are about to see, and that's me, saith the Lord, your Redeemer. One of the first scriptures that I want to get to today is Hebrews 10 and 19, or sorry, Hebrews 10 and 30. Hebrews 10 and verse 30. These are promises of God. God promises to help us. He promises to deliver. He promises to cut off our enemies and bring their plans to nothing. He promises us justice, vengeance, and judgment. Those are promises of God. And he stands by his promises. And he cannot lie. He stands by his word and he's faithful to uphold his word. In Hebrews 10 and verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine. Retribution and the metting out of full justice. God is not looking for partial justice. God is looking for full justice. And he says, it rests with me. I will repay. I will exact the compensation, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge and determine and solve and settle the cause in the cases of his people. God is the ultimate judge. And when he says vengeance is mine, let's look up that word again. Let's look up that word, what that means. Because I think it's really important for people to know if that's a promise of God. What does vengeance mean? Punishment afflicted or retribution exacted for an injury or a wrong. So vengeance, God said, or God says punishment and retribution exacted for an injury or wrong. When God sees what they're doing worldwide, when he sees what they've done with elections, when he sees what they've done with mind control, when he sees what they've done with financial markets all over the world, what they've done with your health, what they've done in every way, God says punishment inflicted or retribution exacted for an injury or wrong. Now, that's justice. That's what, like, in our nation, that's why we have the Constitution of the United States of America that judges are supposed to follow. That's what most people like their, their you know, manual. Their, their manual, their, uh, something that they have to look to, they have to go by. So say, for instance, you buy a car, and you have a, the manual that shows you exactly how this, this vehicle functions. Well, the Constitution shows how this country is supposed to function and how the laws are supposed to be followed. And then you have judges that will uphold it and will uphold with justice. And then you have, which we've seen, a lot of this two-tier justice system, which a lot of people put a spin on it and say exactly what they think the law says. And it's not that at all. Well, God doesn't do that. God is a judge that will uphold the law. He will not go back on his word and he will not twist it. He will uphold the law for justice, freedom, for truth. That's what he does. 
And so a lot of people are wondering, is anything going to happen? That's why you earnestly have to remember all the times that God, you saw that judgment. You saw justice. You saw God's vengeance against his enemies. There's always been that time in the Bible. And if God's the same, then God is going to do something about what we are experiencing right now. He's still the same. You have the enemies trying to twist his word. Not only are they trying to twist the law, but they're trying to twist what God's word actually says and what it stands for. They're always trying to manipulate. They're always trying to change it for their outcome that they want. The enemy's always done that since the beginning. And it's never worked out. That's why that first scripture he gave me this morning is fear not. There's nothing to fear. Why does God keep giving us scriptures about fear not? Why is he giving us these scriptures? Why is he giving us warnings? Because there are things that are going to shake or try to shake your faith. There are things that are going to be overwhelming to get you to look not at the things of God and to look at what the enemies want you to focus on. They want you to focus on their confusion, their chaos, their disruption, their mayhem. They want you to focus and believe and trust in that, that they can do whatever they want and they will get whatever they want. That's not what God says at all. That's why he says, fear not. There's nothing to fear. The true meaning of vengeance, punishment inflicted, and retaliation for an injury or an offense. You think about what the enemies have done against God's people. You think about what they've done with families, what they've done with the law, what they've done with children in schools, what they've done with health, what they've done with the financial system, what they've done with our elections and government. Think about all the wrongs that they have done and all the crimes they've committed. And God says in his word in Psalm 75 and verse 7 that he's the judge over all the earth. He takes down one and lifts up another. Do we believe these scriptures or we don't? We believe that God and his word and he will uphold his word. We believe what he says is true and it will come to pass. That's why we have to have that focus in our foundation on the truth and the word of almighty God. Here's another scripture for you. Psalm 143 and verse 12. Psalm 143 and verse 12. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul. For I am your servant. This is David crying out to him. In your mercy, cut off my enemies. What does God do? He cuts off our enemies. He's asking him. And then if you read in Psalm 143 and verse 7, if we back up a little bit. Verse 7 says, answer me speedily. We don't have to wait a long time. We can ask God to answer us speedily. And if you read all of Psalm 143, you can get kind of that insight of where David was and how afflicted he was, how oppressed he was, how much fear was trying to be put on him. Because if you read in Psalm 143 and verse 3, for the enemy has pursued and persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life down to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places as those who have been long dead. He was surrounded. He was persecuted. He was attacked in all these different ways. He was under such a burden of hopelessness and despair. And out of that darkness, he had to remind himself, God, answer me speedily. And just like where it says in, in uh, 143, verse 12, in your mercy, cut my enemies off. Cut off my enemies, Lord. 
He's seen it happen with Goliath. He's seen it happen with Saul. He's seen it happen with the lion and the bear. He saw these things. This was afflicting his soul so much. He was at a point of breaking. And a lot of God's people are under that hopelessness and despair and that heaviness. And they're at that point of breaking. We have to remind ourselves, just like David did. Just like what he did in, in uh, 1 Samuel. We talked about with, with uh, Ziglag in 1 Samuel 30. 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6. David was greatly distressed. For the men spoke of, spoke of stoning him because the souls of them were bitterly grieved, each man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Why do you think God every day has been giving us words of encouragement? We have to give ourselves this time of spending time with God and read these encouragement scriptures and read what God has done against the enemies of Almighty God and what they've done, what he's done for his people. We have to encourage ourselves. Even when it said right here in the beginning of that scripture, in verse 6, David was greatly grieved. He was under distress. He was overwhelmed. The people, his friends, his colleagues, the people he fought armies with and won were thinking about stoning him because of what they looked like. Because it looked like their sons and their daughters and their wives and all their fortunes were gone. That's what the enemy wants. To have you under that kind of distress where it looks like everything is gone and it's so hopeless, there's no way out of it. David could have sat there and taken it. He could have been stoned to death by his own friends. But you know in the scripture, it's powerful. The beginning of the scripture David was greatly distressed. And at the end of that very same scripture, 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6, it was the answer. But David encouraged himself and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. We need to do that every day. I love how God is giving us prophecies every day encouragement, a good report, the truth. He's giving us these things. So when we are greatly distressed, we can encourage ourselves and strengthen ourselves with the word of God, with his good news, with his good report. So it destroys that distress. It destroys that spirit of heaviness. It destroys the power of the enemy over you. That's why God has had me change these live shows up every morning and start with an encouragement and start with an encouraging scripture. Because God's people right now have to encourage themselves. Ever more, no matter what is going on, we have to encourage ourselves even more now than we ever have in our lives. There's so many things on a daily basis that our enemy, you know, sh shoots these dar darts and these arrows and there's all these things at us all the time. Every day there's like a new discouragement or new frustration or a new report that can just give, get us to give up. We can't focus on what the enemy is doing. And it's so easy. Especially if you're a person you have symptoms in your body on a continual daily basis. And I know what that's like. When you have thoughts in your mind and try to destroy your mind every second of every day, I know what that's like. But that's the reason why we have to encourage ourselves on a daily basis. The reason why wait, my thoughts are telling me, this is what my body is telling me, this is what the news is saying. This is what my family or my lawyer or my doctor or whatever it is 
is trying to put you in that, just like David, greatly distressed. The enemy is trying to put you in a distressful situation every single day. But we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord and strengthen ourselves in God's strength every day to destroy the power of the enemy. And if we're praising God, like there has been so many different times. Well, I was under a great stress and a great attack yesterday. And one of the things that I had to do, say, Julie, you were under attack. Of course. All God's people can be on our attack from time to time. It's what we do with it. I went upstairs, started praying, and I started praising. No matter how bad that attack was, and no matter how bad it seemed to overwhelm my mind and my body, I started praising and worshiping God, and the attack stopped. And so what we had to do, we don't praise God because of the attack. I didn't praise him because of symptoms that were in my body and what my mind was telling me. I didn't, I wasn't praising God because of that. I was praising him and thanking him for his goodness because of what he said he's already done. I started, remember, we enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. And so when our enemy wants to beat us down in the ground, and get us full of hopeless and despair. And instead, we encourage ourselves. And we receive the strength from God. And we start praising and worshiping God. We are entering the courts with thanksgiving and praise. And it stops the enemy. I can't tell you how quickly I started putting on praise and worship music on. And I started lifting my hands. I just started thanking God for his promises. Thanking God for his word. And thanking God that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And it stopped. That's how we have to handle situations. Just as the scripture in 1 Samuel 30, it's a, in verse 6, it's a powerful, powerful scripture. What, ha, what David was at at the very beginning of that scripture and where he was at the end. We can make that determination. We have to stop letting our enemy choose our attitude for the day. You know what? I don't care. A lot of attacks, a lot of stress, a lot of frustration. But I will keep my joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We all have to remind ourselves of that. He's trying your strength on a daily basis. That's why you ask God to help you protect your joy. Now I want to read down and uh, farther in 1 Samuel 30 and verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? The Lord answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them without fail and recover all. That's what's on the heart and the mind of God. So when David was greatly distressed, he was frustrated. He, was, he lost everything it looked like. He couldn't get into a darker and deeper hole than he was in. But he chose to get up. He chose to encourage himself and receive God's strength. And then he asked God, well, what do you want me to do? My enemies have stolen everything. They took my wife, they took my children, and, and all my armies and their wives and their children. They took all of our money. They burned everything. We have nothing left. So, Lord, what do you want me to do about this attack? And the Lord said to him, pursue, overtake, and recover all without fail. You're not going to fail. Why did David not fail? Because God was with him. And you can see in 1 Samuel 30, verse 19, nothing was missing, small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David recovered all. Why did David recover all? Because he lit, didn't let himself stay distressed. He didn't let himself stay in fear. He didn't let himself stay so overwhelmed in depression 
He encouraged himself. He got up. He started praising and worshiping God and then and asking God, God, you are the alpha. You are the mega. You're the beginning and the end. What do you want me to do? And God said, you pursue, you overtake and recover all without fail. And the only reason why David got that outcome is because David got himself up. He encouraged himself and then he obeyed God and God's instruction. That's the key. We had to pick ourselves up. Remember Micah chapter 7, verse 8. Rejoice on against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall what? Arise. Sometimes we have to be our own cheerleader. I used to be a cheerleader as a kid. I was like middle school age, I think. I don't think I did it in high school. I did it in middle school. I used to be a cheerleader. And there are times, you know, sitting on the sideline and the guys are doing really bad. They're not making a lot of shots. And, you know, our job was to cheer them up. Our job was to get them, get, get them encouraged again and give them hope again. Like, hey, the game's not over. There's still time left on the clock. And then you get all the crowd going and the crowd gets all excited. And all of a sudden it gives those players a boost of encouragement. Sometimes we have to be our own cheerleaders. Sometimes we have to drag ourselves by the ear in front of a mirror and say, I am not going to stay down. I am not going to stay depressed. I am not going to stay overwhelmed because the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I am not going to sit here and let you, Satan, steal my joy. Because you know what it says in God's word in Colossians 2.15? Satan, you've been disarmed. It also says in Hebrews 2.14, Jesus brought you to nothing. So I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. And if he did it for David, if he told David to pursue, overtake, and recover all, I know he's speaking that to me right now. And I'm going to recover all that's been lost and stolen from me. I'm going to recover all because that's the promise of Almighty God. The promise of Almighty God is I will not fail. The promise of Almighty God in 2 Corinthians 2.14, he always caused me to triumph. Those are my promises. Those are the promises that God has given to me so I can hold on to. He said in his word in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. You choose. David chose to get up. David chose to encourage himself. David chose to inquire himself and say, God, what should I do? He chose that life. He chose that blessing. And that's what we have to do. We have to get up and choose. Here's another example. In Luke. Luke 15. This is another really great story. I was going through something several years ago. And, of course, I'm my worst critic. I persecute myself more than anybody else would. I'm hard on myself, and I have been for a very long time. And I remember I was just really, really down so hard. And I asked the Lord. I had to seek God and ask him what he wanted me to do. And he said, I want you to go read the story of the prodigal son. I knew where it was. So I opened up the Bible, and I read it. And look what it says here. So I'm not going to read the whole entire story. But the story is there was a man, and he had two sons. And one of his sons wanted to take his inheritance early, and he wanted to leave home. Well, his father gave him his inheritance what belonged to him. And then he went out into the world and he blew it all. He was so full of sin, made every wrong decision he could possibly have made. And he ended up, a Jewish boy, ended up in a pig pen. They can't eat hog, pork, let alone be anywhere near them. And he's sleeping in a pig pen, and he's eating what they eat. So you could say the prodigal son was that he was very distressed. He was in a very hopeless situation where it didn't look like there was any way out. 
He couldn't do it. He could not get any worse than he was at already at. Look what it says in verse 17. So in verse 16, it was it also talked about how he was so willing to eat. Well, we call it pig slop. Just a whole bunch of stuff that you don't want to think about that you give pigs. Well, they used to. I don't know if they give them that stuff anymore, but he was willing to eat it. Verse 17 is the key. It reminds me of David in 1 Samuel. I just read you. Luke 15 and verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have enough food, even food to spare? But I am perishing and dying here of hunger. Verse 18. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth in your sight. Verse 19. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hired servants. That's how a lot of God's people think about themselves. I'm not worthy to receive God's love. So they hide from him. That's what I was doing. I didn't think I was worthy to receive his forgiveness or his love at all. And that's why he had me read it. And so I sat there with tears in my eyes and he said, keep reading. I knew what he was getting at. Verse 20, so he got up and came to his own father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity and tenderness for him, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him fervently. He was full of manure, Now I live in Iowa, and I know how bad manure smells, but his father didn't care. He didn't care how bad his son smelled. He only cared. That his father was that his son was alive. That's all the father cared about. His son was alive, and his son came home. And I sat there for a minute on my bed, crying in tears. And I said, "Lord, what are you trying to tell me exactly?" And he said, "Julie, my plans for my children never change. And no matter how long they've been gone for, and the decisions they've made." which they regret. I'm always waiting as a father with open arms, waiting to receive my children. No matter what we ever do, no matter how bad our past decisions have ever been, our father is there with open arms waiting for us to come back home, for us to ask him to forgive us, his version of us, the way he sees us, it doesn't change. I sat there and I cried and I realized. I sat there and I tried to run away from God because of sins that I made and how much I could not stand what I have done. And I couldn't stand who I was. And then he was telling me, you're seeing it wrong. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to receive you with open arms. And my life and my future for you never changed. So no matter what you've ever done, what God is saying to you today is you go to him and he's waiting for you with open arms. What you have to do is get up. You have to go toward him. And receive his forgiveness, receive his love, receive his mercy, and receive his plan that he's always had for you that never changed. And if you read on about the prodigal son, is that they, the father had a, he was celebrating. He had a great celebration. God's always celebrating when his kids come home. And it says kids receive what he has for them, which is his love. His forgiveness in the future he's always intended for you to have. All right, now I'm going to go back over this prophetic word because it's extremely important. What are you saying for us right now? So Julie, how does this relate to this prophecy? It relates in a lot of ways. 
Because no matter what the enemy intended for this nation, or your nation, or your mind, or your body, your marriage, your children, your finances, remember, fear not. There's nothing to fear. Remember, even if we're greatly distressed, God gives us the ability to encourage ourselves. And the end result is to pursue, overtake, and recover all. We have to resist the temptation of hopelessness and despair. We have to resist the temptation of giving up and quitting. Even though our hearts may be greatly distressed and our circumstances are screaming at us, there's no hope. We go to the Father, and there's always hope for our end result. All right. Here's a prophetic word once again. Now, remember the Lord has been talking about a silence. He's been talking about outages, blackouts. He's been talking about things that are unprecedented, unconventional, unusual. He's been saying all these things are, are going to intensify. He's been warning you of this very thing. Look what happened with David. It looked like David lost everything. It looked like all hope was gone. You have to encourage yourself, no matter what we are about to see, and no matter what we are about to hear. You have to encourage yourself. Go inquire of God. Go ask him, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to see this? How do you want me to handle it? What do you have for me? And so God will give you the final outcome. He will give you his desire. His desire is for you to have victory. He's not going to give you something negative. If there's an evil report out there of hopelessness, doom and despair, and doom and gloom, that's not God's. That's what your enemy wants you to believe. God is warning us about what we are going to see. At the same time, he's warning us. He's giving us hope, and he's telling us, do not fear. <clears throat> We've already seen a foreshadowing of things to come. Just like what I've been telling you and reminding you, this is what happened with Microsoft. Just like what happened with that cybersecurity company. I don't remember what the company's name was. And um, everything went down in a lot of places. I mean, it was it made a disaster. It was like catastrophic for airlines. There were so many things that were effect, affected by this one mistake that was made by one company. We have enemies right now. They're trying to attack our infrastructure. I got that prophecy. I think I'll give that one out or God's going to give it out. Think of right now, the war is different now. It's not just they're going to bring a whole bunch of people and start shooting guns. An attack can be a cyber attack. It could be silent. You won't even see it coming. No matter the attack, though, what's the scripture that we hold on to? We hold on to that there's no weapon formed against that shall prosper. So our enemies may choose multiple different types of weapons, even at one time. But it doesn't matter what weapons they use. They're going to lose in this battle because they're coming up against God and God promises, just like he said in the beginning when I gave you that scripture in Hebrews 10 and 30, he promises vengeance. He promises judgment. He promises justice. That's what he promises. So what we have to do is we have to stay focused and encourage ourselves, just like David did. David had encouraged himself by what? Reminding himself of what God said and what God has already done in the past for him. First paragraph. Again, this is a prophecy called the silencers are about to be silenced. This is from September 4th. For I, the Lord, this day am telling you, my children, the silencers are about to be silenced in a massive way. They have done everything they can to stop you from telling the truth, showing the truth, and they have chained you in their prison cells of the disinformation and deception. 
I'm going to go slow right there. I'm going to read that again. They have done everything they can to stop you from telling the truth or showing the truth. Just like how I was cut off from YouTube six times. What are they, and I asked themselves, really? I asked them, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? They're afraid of the truth. They don't like the truth. They don't like people showing the truth because it goes against their narrative. And if it goes against their narrative, it goes against and it will destroy their control. Because he says right here, they have chained you. Remember, God says we're supposed to shake those shackles off. We're supposed to destroy those chains they've had on us. One of them is they've chained you in their prison cells of disinformation and deception. So people been imprisoned and have been chained by disinformation and deception. So how do you break free from those chains? You hear the truth. They're trying to hold you there in their captivity. That's why they're trying to silence people. But just wait when you see how I silence your enemies, how I will stop them in their tracks and destroy their power. They will no longer be able to use our tech giants and social media companies to determine what can be put on the airwaves. No, it's not theirs to control, but mine, says the Lord. Well, everything on this earth is God's. He's the one who designed it. I want to read you something really quickly. Um, I don't have time to read the whole entire chapter. Psalms 8. Psalms 8 and verse 2. So when I, when I heard this prophetic word, and then he gave me the title for it this morning. I heard the prophetic word on the 4th. He gave me the title for it this morning before I got on here. So I pray into the the title. And I said, okay, Lord, what scriptures go along with this? Because he will always back up his word with, with uh, the prophecies with his written word. And then he showed me Psalms 8, verse 2. This is a classic amplified. Out of the mouths of babes and unweaned and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, that you might silence the enemy and the avenger. God silences the enemy and the avenger. So the naysayers would say, well, God doesn't say that. Right here in his word. He silences the avenger, the avenger and the enemy. Also, Psalm 44 Psalm 44 and verse 6. Psalm 44, verse 6 says, For I will not trust and lean on my bow, neither shall my sword save me. That's, that goes along saying, I'm not going to do things by my own strength or ability. I'm not going to use natural weapons. Verse 7. But you have saved us from our foes and have put them to shame who hate us. This is David, remember. David is saying, you have saved us from our foes and have put them to shame who hate us. That's what God does. He is a deliverer. Um, go to Zechariah really quick. Sorry, not Zechariah. Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3, verse 15. Now I went to Zechariah. <laughs> Zephaniah 3 and verse 15. For then it will be that the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cast out your enemy, the king of Israel. Even the Lord himself is in the midst of you. And after he has come to you, he shall not experience fear, evil, and evil no more. Or in another translation, it says, the Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast your enemy your enemy out. He's cast out our enemy. Remember, he cuts them off. 
The king of Israel, the Lord, is, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. So he's cutting off their plans. He says, you shall see disaster no more. All right, let's keep reading in this prophecy. A great silence is coming for the ones that have silenced you. The world will become very quiet worldwide. That has to cut off their power so they can, can give them back to you. So God's going to cut off their power, their propaganda machines, and that power is going to be given back to you. What? Your own way of thinking. And so they, they've been propping up so much with propaganda and lies and disinformation. And it's changed people's way they think. He said, so... So as these things take place with outages, just know it's your enemies that will remain silent and not you. Your enemies will not outlast the silence because these are the days of famine. Remember, it says in Psalm 37, verse 9, that he cuts the enemies off and where they were, they will be no more, will be found no more. All right, and that was just a quote. So I don't have time to go back and read it right now. I have to keep reading. My children, get out of those prison cells and shout my words as loud as you can. That will destroy those chains that have tried to keep you in. These are the days of my vengeance and it's about to be seen. Remember God's vengeance, it's his punishment. And then one of the greatest examples of the punishment that God pours out against the enemies of Almighty God, go read the book of Exodus. The rattling, the shaking, the unprecedented, the unconventional, the unusual will intensify. A lot of God's people don't, don't even know this, so they're not prepared. You are going to see these things you have never seen. You are going to see things you have never seen before. You are going to hear things you've never heard. There will be things that will be hard to comprehend. You may be asking yourself, is this really happening? I remember, I don't know how many times during COVID I asked that question. Is this really happening? Can I really not go into a store? Do I really have to wait in line because I have to wait for somebody else to leave because they're only allowing a certain amount of people in the store? Is this really happening when there's no more toilet paper in stores because people have frantically been stocking it up? Is there really a toilet paper shortage? Do we really have to wear masks everywhere we go? Can we really not go into churches because they're shutting them down? We can't, we can't go into certain stores. We can't do certain things. Really? It was like a dream. Like it wasn't reality. He says, it will be like a dream for you, but a nightmare for the ones against you. That means it's not going to affect you like it's going to affect them. I am rattling the cages of the enemies and bringing them to where I need them for their final trap and their total destruction. I am shaking this earth to break it free from the chains of the globalists. You are not their slaves. You are not theirs to control. And soon this will be a reality worldwide. Go read Haggai 2, 6 through 9. I do not have time for it today. Just as the days of Egypt. Now he's going back and using that as a comparison. Just as the days of Egypt, unprecedented weather, unprecedented things will be seen and experienced by the enemies of my people. Things that we just, our mind will not comprehend when we see them. He says judgment after judgment to hit them repeatedly until they let my people go once and for all. That's why all those judgment or the plagues hit Egypt because Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. They are refusing to let us go. They saw and experienced things that had never happened like that on the earth. And now, so he was saying, look, even in the midst of Egypt, Land of Goshen, in the book of Exodus, 
God said, my people saw things they had never seen. They had heard things they have never heard. It was unprecedented, unconventional, and they saw these things strike their enemies time after time after time. But he says, that is all going to be amplified. That means what we saw and we read in the book of Exodus, what God's people saw, this is going to be amplified. That means to a greater degree. Okay. Let's get out the true definition for it because I know there's a better definition. He's saying he's using the word amplified. Increase of volume, especially using an amplifier, or increase the amplitude or uh, cause to become more marked or intense. God's saying it's intense. Everything is intensifying. Cause become more marked or intense. That's the thing that he's saying is amplified. He's saying that is all going to be amplified around the world and in my nation of the United States. So what nation is it going to shake? Our country. My children, you are in for unconventional things. We're in a time where it's unconventional. Things are not normal. Things are not uh, things you are not used to in an election cycle. Remember, he said this was going to be an unconventional election. Well, it already is. It already has been. In so many different ways. <laughs> unconventional and unprecedented when they're using the law and twisting the law against a rightful sitting president, who is the rightful one, President Trump, because it was stolen from him since 2020. And then you have him try to assassinate him. You have the, his opponents that are not great enough, so they have a coup right in front of the world to get rid of one puppet to replace him with another puppet. You have all these indictments. All this stuff is unconventional and unprecedented. This has never happened before. Even though they're trying to normalize it, it's never happened like this before. Guys have been talking to us about an unconventional and unprecedented election for two years before all of this even started. God's been saying this over and over and over again. God repeats himself because sometimes his children don't listen. The first time. And I know when my kids were little sometimes, even though they're older, I have to repeat myself. God has to repeat himself to get our attention. So things you are not used to in an election cycle, unprecedented, unconventional. Your enemies are terrified of their numbers. They are terrified of your resistance. So that's why we're going to see, start to see things that even happen even more now. They're terrified of losing control. So they are willing to do anything they can, no matter the cost, to destroy my David and this country for the rest of the way. So if we have an election and, and President Trump wins it, and people don't put your guard down. There's a long time between the election and an inauguration. Don't put your guard down. Don't put your guard down now. Don't put your guard down then. Whether we have one or not, it doesn't matter. Either way... It's not an election that's going to save this country. God never said we weren't going to have one. But he did say we didn't need one to save this country. He's the one. We have to give all glory to God. They are willing to do anything they can, no matter what the cost, to destroy my David in this country the rest of the way. They will get other nations involved to do some of their dirty work. Well, they've already brought, they've already gotten Venezuela, inv Venezuela involved. They've already gotten these other uh, countries because they brought terrorist people here. Now there's terrorist cells everywhere. Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, all the ones you can think of, they're here. 
he says they've got they will get other nations involved to get to do do some of their dirty work, but it doesn't matter who they choose, it will be the wrong choice. Because remember, God said no matter who they choose, they lose. No matter the nation, no nor man, no nation, no man, or their army can stop what's coming for your enemies, and that's my vengeance. And judgment will, judgment will hit them like the plagues of Egypt to rip them out of their power and their chains off of your nets. You don't belong to them, and I will soon make that clear, saith the Lord of hosts. God is making all these things clear. Let's keep reading. My children, stand and pray like never before. That's why we're never supposed to let our guard down. You are about to experience a resistance. That means a resistance or a pushback from the prayers that we've been praying. We're going to start seeing more things try to come at us. And God says, you push them back and you resist with prayer. Don't back off. Um, you experience a resistance like never before, but remember, it will not last and it's not bigger than me. Your enemies will try and attack you in unprecedented ways. He's using that word again. They will try things so devastating it will look like, but it will all backfire against them. He says it's going to look like it, but it's going to backfire on them. A lot of things have already backfired on them. Every move they make to take over this nation will be every move toward their great des destruction. That's exactly what happened with Pharaoh. Every time he pursued God's people and he pursued them even more, he tried to bring more devastation to them. It became more devastating to him. He said Obama is nothing, Kamala is nothing, the Biden is nothing, the Clintons are nothing, Klaus Schwab is nothing, the elites are nothing, their establishment is nothing. Don't you see, my children, your enemies are nothing. And I am the Lord that will cut them off and bring their plans to nothing. My army is moving forward to take them all out, saith the Lord of hosts. God is putting in, in putting out names. But he's saying, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who they are. They all lose. George Soros' money will be exposed in a major way. Some of it already has, but it's going to be even more. How he and his fellow elites were using their fortunes to rule the world and change world events along with elections. They haven't just poured their money into this election. They poured their money into elections worldwide. How their money helped them fund the machine in Washington. So people like Bill Gates, Klaus Schwab, George Soros, the elites, they fund the establishment. And paid many of your government, your governmental officials, to pass bills that take more of your freedoms away. It's not a person. Like, you know how the Biden was supposedly the resident. He was the one making these decisions. And people think it's Obama. He's all powerful. No, he's not. He's got people that control him. My children, Soros, Gates, Klaus Schwab, the secret societies and the UN that is really is running your government like the WHO, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, the WEF, those people are the ones who are controlling the governments around the world. And the markets, they control the economy worldwide who are controlling the mainstream media and social media to control what is allowed to be said over the news or what people worldwide are allowed to speak about. Total censorship because they wanted total control. That's what censorship is about, control. Their machine is dying. What machine is he talking about? The establishment. Their power is collapsing. Their house of cards that took so long to build, took a long time, hundreds of years, is falling apart and crumbling to the ground. So hold on for their last-ditch efforts to stay in power. But just like Pharaoh and his last efforts were for nothing. It was his final act, and then it was all over. His final act was to pursue God's people up to the Red Sea. And that was his final act. He went into the Red Sea and he was done. My children, your enemies, the pharaohs of today, their end is drawing near. And that will be very clear, says, says the Lord. Then he goes on to talk about the UN. The UN will make a bold move against the United States and the land of Israel. But the UN doesn't have the power like they thought they had. And they will regret the decisions they have just made when they give themselves away and they won't stay. Because the UN will be ripped apart by me, says the Lord. This is not the first time he's talked about um, the ripping this, the UN apart. Because the UN is just a part of the establishment as well. It's part of the global government. 
Something hidden regarding the Afghanistan withdrawal is about to make major headlines and be a nightmare for the Biden and Harris, along with the entire establishment. A piece of information no one knew anyone had is about to be released, and it will crush their narrative in one full swoop. So something's going to come out. There's a whistleblower that's going to come out with major and damning information against the Biden and Kamala. And remember, some of this stuff is allowed to come out. Pakistan will be in your news for a shocking reason. This is not the first time he's mentioned Pakistan. Um, And then an earthquake in Istanbul will be in your news for a significant reason. I told you many unprecedented and unusual things will be taking place worldwide, and it will shock the world. So remember, he says shock and awe. I bet you the land of Goshen was shocked when they started seeing all that stuff happen. Uh, Tamar, I think that's how you pronounce it, T-A-M-A-R. This name and this river will be in your news for a surprising reason. A presidential seal will be in your news for a significant reason. I think this is like the second or third time he's also talked about a presidential seal. Whether it's this presidential seal or or another one from another country, but something will be significant about it in the news. My children, change is coming. He keeps warning us about change. And unprecedented events will start to take place for your freedoms. My vengeance is guaranteed against your enemies, and soon they will not be laughing and mocking my words when they see all the nation, when all these, these come to pass. All this what? All these words come to pass. Just like how they were mocking Noah, and they were mocking him and building that ark, they weren't mocking him anymore when they started seeing rain for the first time in their lives, and they, they saw what was, everything was flooding and all this destruction until the point where it was too late. They mocked God until those doors were shut and that rain started. Then they tried changing their tune, but it was too late. So get ready for a great and significant change upon the earth to bring you out of the hands of the pharaohs of today. Freedom is yours and no longer will they be able to manipulate it under their control or under their power. So prepare your hearts on what you are about to see. And that's me, saith the Lord, your Redeemer. So God has been warning us about what we're going to see, and people are going to start getting in a panic mode, which they did in the land of Israel when they started seeing all this destruction and all of uh, Pharaoh trying to do things against the land of Goshen and against God's people, and it didn't last, and it didn't work. This is not going to last, and this is not going to work. Be encouraged. Read these scriptures that God has given you and I today. Again, this is not the teaching and the scriptures that I had for today. God needed you to hear this. I need to hear this. Everyone needs to hear this. What God is saying, the revelation that he's pouring out right now, is for you and I to have be deeply rooted in his word so we won't be moved. So when we see these things he's been warning us about, we won't fear. Fear not. There's nothing to fear. Now I pray over each and every one of you right now and destroy that power of fear and anything that's been trying to keep you back and hold you down. So, Father God, right now in Jesus' name, we thank you for the revelation and the scriptures that you have poured out to us today. We thank you, Father God, for giving us the examples of David, giving us the examples of the prodigal son, giving us the examples of what happened to Pharaoh and what happened to your people. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are the one, the most high God. And you said in your written word, fear not, there's nothing to fear. We break the power of fear over your children, over their minds right now by the blood of Jesus. And by the power and the authority of that name, that name that's above every name. And so, Father God, I thank you. That fear that's trying to overwhelm them, the stress and frustration distress and circumstances are trying to overwhelm them and bring such a great heaviness, hopelessness, and despair. We break that power. We break the chains of the enemy right now by the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father God, that they are encouraging themselves in you. I thank you, Father God, the joy of the Lord. Pour out your joy upon them like never before. I thank you, Father God. They know. They know how important it is to protect their joy. And no matter the weapon, 
No weapon formed against us shall prosper. And so, Father God, I thank you that you're putting a hedge of protection around your people. And no matter what unprecedented, unconventional, unusual things that we are about to see, we are in this world, but we are not of it. We are not subject to it. Just like you said in John 17, 13 through 17. But it also says in your word in Colossians 1 and 13, you drew us out of the darkness of this world. You are protecting us from that darkness and from that despair, just as you did in the land of Goshen. We don't know how you're going to do it. We just know, Father God, that you will cut our enemies off. And where we see them today, we will soon see them no more. You silence our enemies and our foes and our adversaries. And Father God, your hand, no foe can withstand. So we thank you for power and revelation knowledge that you're giving to us on a daily basis. We thank you, Father God, for your love and mercy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And we thank you, Father God, that this is a day that you have made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This is why it's so important to never take my word for what I'm saying. You always get it to the word of God. Because he's using my mouth, he's using this platform to get these words and to get this revelation knowledge out. But it truly is him. It's not me. I could never take credit for something that he's doing and the revelations that he's giving out. So I want you to have a greater revelation of God and have a greater fellowship of who he is and what he has for you. So I hope to encourage you today. And if you do have any prayer requests or praise reports, don't forget. We as a uh, prayer team here at, G at JGMI, we are praying for each and every one of you. You are not alone. So bring in your prayer requests. You can write us at our um, in our description box. You can there's where our address is, our um, our well our website where you can go under our contact page. It's jgminternational.org under our contact page. And I just want to say, if you want any Julie Green Ministries merchandise like Make America Pray Again, there is brand new hats, and if you are wanting a cross hat and you're a female and you want a pink one. Well, we now have pink cross hats. So if you want to go to Three Suns Threads, that's threesunsthreads.com. And any other merchandise, you can go to threesunsthreads.com. So I hope that encourages you today. Please like, subscribe, and share and give this to everyone you know. Who needs to hear an encouraging word? Because the word and the truth of God will set you free. God loves you. I love you. God bless you. And have a wonderful day.